first of all, uh, I want to disclose something. Ruth and I are friends, and we were colleagues at the LA Times through the 80s. And um, I watched every day as she ate a donut and had black coffee <laughs> <laughs> for breakfast, and she never gained any weight. <laughs> I was like Miss Plump. Uh, I reread uh, several of her memoirs before uh, coming here today, and I was struck by three things. Her incredible writing talent, her extraordinary uh, kindness and, and involvement with the many people whose lives have intertwined with hers. <laughs> right? And the fact that she really is a very good cook. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to begin with this. Okay, made notes. It is magical to join you searching out the woman your mother wanted you to be. Your mother had her own vision. You had a quite different one. The woman you became is your vision, encapsulated and incorporeal. What advice would you give to other women who want to make that same voyage of discovery? Wow. <laughs> it's not like you're starting with the easy <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny that you start with that because you're kind of starting with Not Becoming My Mother, which is the book that I think because I broke my foot on the first day of book tour for that, um, it never got the respect that I think it deserved. It's a little tiny book, um, and it really is an homage, not just to my mother, but to the women of her generation. And, um, you know, that book came out of a speech I gave to 1,500 people, and I got up and said, today would have been my mother's 100th birthday. And I have to tell you that I wake up every morning glad that I'm not her. And there was this gasp in the audience. <laughs> Everybody went, <gasps> and one of my friends said, oh, God, I didn't know where you were going with that. <laughs> but I went on to say that the women of my mother, my mother was born in 1908, so the women of her generation were, I mean, she and all her friends were smart well-educated and not basically allowed to work. And um, that what I took away from that was that I was always going to work. I mean, what I saw was my mother's frustration at having all this energy and intelligence and nothing to do with it. You know, those post-war women were told to put on their aprons and go back to their households. And um, my father came home every night he loved his work, he was a book designer, and I saw how fulfilled he was. And so I was really grateful when I looked back at my mother's life, at how much she, her lesson to me was, don't let anyone keep you from doing the work that you want to do. Don't ever believe that all you were put on this earth to do is take care of a man. And that, I feel extraordinarily fortunate to have had that kind of upbringing. And later, after I gave this speech, I went into the restroom, and there were all these women in there weeping and wanting to tell me the story of their mothers who had been the same. So, you know, what I would say to young women today is um, follow your passions, do work know that you have intelligence and energy and that um, you, should, you should use it, use it in the best possible way. So I think most people here are familiar with Ruth's story that she came home one day when you were 12 <laughs> and her mother asked her a question in French. They had been to Paris that summer and Ruth couldn't answer because she didn't speak French, and her mother took her on the train the next day to Montreal and put her in a convent school. <laughs> nice, nice girl from New York City suddenly in the convent school, but 
it did help you discover food. It really did. I, I mean, first of all, I, I call that chapter in my book Mars because it, I mean, to suddenly be in a world where you don't understand anything that anyone is saying. I mean, I was in a school where, I mean, first of all, I'm a little Jewish girl from New York and I'm in a convent school. <laughs> and secondly, I literally do not understand a word that anyone is saying and I can't communicate with anyone. And Her it, mother thought it was the immersion way to learn French. <laughs> <laughs> It, this is not working either? <laughs> okay, is this better? Oh, yeah. oh okay, sorry. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that it did was give me a kind of empathy that I would not have had before. You know, I'd grown up in New York and there were all these foreign, I mean, I went to PS41 and there were foreign kids in the class who you know came from Puerto Rico or from China or Japan, and suddenly I knew what it felt like to be an outsider, which is something that has pretty much informed the rest of my life. But the other thing that happened was um, I made friends with, I did not say this in the book, but it, um, actually it was the daughter of the French ambassador to Canada. And Beatrice. She Beatrice. Beatrice. And she, she yeah. took me home with her, and she had this relationship with her parents that very upper-class French people have, where she vouvoied her parents. She used the formal term when she spoke to her parents, which shocked me. I mean, the idea that you would, you know, address your parents in this formal language. And she didn't see much of her parents. You know, she, the children ate alone. Um, they ate with the servants, and her parents, she was occasionally trotted down to visit her parents. But um, because it was my first night there, we were invited to eat dinner with the parents. And of course, they had a cook. And I was a greedy child. I always loved food. And her father was enchanted by... I mean, they gave me my first souffle, uh, a first real salad with, you know, really nice greens and real olive oil, which in 1961, there was no olive oil in America. And um, a very ripe brie. And I was just, I was over the moon. And he was enchanted by my loving food. And my friend Beatrice, saw that this was a way to get to her father. And she began, became interested in food. And for me, it was an introduction to the idea that food was a language and it was a way of getting to know people. Um, that really, if um, you wanted to know someone, if you watched what they ate, um, that MFK Fisher, that Bria Savara was right, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. And um, I started from that point on, and in, I was invited back many times. Beatrice and her father had a new relationship, and I began seeing the world food forward. I mean, it was just, it was such a revelation to me that, oh, this is a way of looking at the world. So also, uh, before that, um, kind of the concept that good mothering is good cooking. Mrs. Peavy, <laughs> Mrs. Peavy, oh, right? Mrs. Peavy. And Alice with Aunt Bertie, right? And uh, I include in this list Beatrice's father. You mothered yourself by cooking. You did. And I read this book um, a long time ago, and then I reread it. And it didn't hit me so hard about the mothering equals cooking and cooking eating equals mothering. But boy, it really swept over me. Well, you know, I've always believed that it's impossible to be a good cook if you're not, if you don't have a generous soul. And that there is a kind of generosity about food people, which is what attracted me to food in the first place. And 
you know, Alice was um, a, an extraordinary example. I mean, Alice Waters. No, no. This I'm oh, talking Alice, about. Alice I'm talking the cook. Alice oh. the cook. Who and there's recipes. Who was my aunt Bertie's um, black cook? Who, you know, in the fifties, I would go shopping with her. And I saw that she walked into the store and she was a superb cook. Um, and my Aunt Bertie didn't have much money, but Alice stayed with her through thick and thin. And I saw that when Alice walked into the store, she was a queen. I mean, she, the butcher did not, you know, she would look at, and I, so I saw that um, it was, for her, a way of getting respect in the world, that she got it through food, and that then she gave it back to us through her food. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, it, was, it was just like for my father, who was German, um, I saw that he would take me up to Yorktown. And, I mean, he came to the United States when he was 26. And when he wanted to go home, he went up to Yorktown and went into a butcher shop and started speaking German. And I was suddenly seeing my father in a way I had never seen him before, um, that he was through food at home. Um, and then he and I started like walking through New York and he would take me to um, La Marqueta, and I would suddenly look at people who were going home by touching their food. Um, and so I feel like my whole life, every lesson I got, I mean, I guess we all get the lessons we need, but the lessons I got were pay attention to food because it's everything. So almost all of your women, almost all of your mentor, mentors, for the first, for a long time. For a long time. Were women, and, and two of them, I'd like you to talk about them just for a little bit. One is uh, Marion Cunningham, ah. and the other is the extraordinary Cecilia Chang. Okay, so Marion Cunningham was, I, she, her story, which there's so many of us who loved Marion, she was kind of the food mother to um, the burgeoning food movement in the 70s and 80s. And her story was extraordinary. And um, was, again, it, it's a, a story of an American woman who, um, she married her high school sweetheart, and then she became incredibly agoraphobic. And, um, she literally could barely leave her house and she also became very alcoholic and she told me once that she was so afraid that they would stop making vodka <laughs> that she she said you looked in my house and there was vodka stop it was under every bed in every closet um, and she was so agoraphobic and she was so afraid of elevators that she could not have a child until they built a uh, maternity ward on the ground floor of her hospital. And so, but she finally, she, on her own, not doing a seven step thing or anything, she just decided she had to stop drinking and she did. And she took up cooking instead and she started teaching cooking classes. And for her 45th birthday, her son, gave her a ticket to James Beard's class in, in Oregon. She was living in the Bay Area of California. She had never been on an airplane. She had never left the state of California. And she said, I can't get on that plane. And her son said to her, if you don't get on that plane, you'll never do anything and you'll never be anything. And she got on the plane and she cried all the way there. She was terrified. She got off the plane. She went to this class. And James Beard saw something in her. And she became his assistant. And she started traveling around the world. 
with James. I mean, it changed her life completely. But there's a dark side to this story, too. So then um, she, she was a prolific letter writer and a real, I mean, I, I sp for years I spoke to Marion every day on the phone. Um, but when Judith Jones was looking for someone to write the, a new version of the Fanny Farmer cookbook, he gave Judith, James gave Judith Marion's letters. And so Judith said she's perfect and suddenly she is writing the Fanny Farmer cookbook and she becomes a famous cookbook author. She, with her first royalty check, went out and bought a Jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> but the dark side to this story is her family could not cope with the successful woman that she became. And it was huge resentment in the family. Her relationship with her husband really deteriorated. Um, you know, she wasn't home cooking for the family all the time. I mean, she was off being someone else. And so she became the mother to the food world, but her own personal life really became difficult. And Kim Severson of the New York Times and I both keep saying, you know, somebody has to write Marion's life. I mean, it is a real, it's another classic tale of that generation of women that there was a price to the kind of success that she had. Talk a little bit about Cecilia. About Cecilia. So Cecilia uh, was one of the most remarkable women. I've, she, Cecilia um, walked out of China. She, her father was a doctor and a scholar. She was the seventh daughter. And he was, so Cecilia died, what, two years ago at 100. Um, her father was a very progressive man who did not believe in having his daughter's feet bound, and which saved her life because um, during the revolution, she and one sister, they sold gold into the hems of their skirts and they walked um, hundreds and hundreds of miles out of Shanghai and into free China. And she ultimately married a man who was very close to Chiang Kai-shek and they went to Taiwan and he became the Taiwanese ambassador to Japan, so they lived in Japan. And she ended up coming to America to visit her sisters and ultimately she, s she signed a contract for somebody needed to borrow some money of somebody she met, needed to borrow some money because she was buying, uh, renting a restaurant, and Cecilia lent her the money, and then the woman backed out, and Cecilia was suddenly stuck in America. She'd invested all this money, and so she became a kind of accidental restaurateur. Um, she ended up making a small fortune. She had a house, in an apartment in San Francisco, a house in Tiburon, and a house in Beverly Hills. And each of them had a car, a Bentley, not a Bentley, a Rolls Royce attached to it. Um, and her, her place in Beverly Hills had an indoor swimming pool. Um, she had um, this, she would have closets full of exotic um, food that she brought back from Hong Kong. Um, this was before we all knew that, you know, you, you shouldn't be eating shark's fin. And she had a shark's fin closet. <laughs> and a cognac closet. Um, and um, she was one of the people who, um, she and MFK Fisher and Marion, you know, when I was a freelance writer in, in the Bay Area and um, the LA Times asked me to come be their restaurant critic and um, I was scared and said, no, I wasn't gonna do it. And Cecilia said, don't be ridiculous, of course you're gonna go do that. You know, she was, she was just a risk taker, and I'm really grateful that she pushed me to take risks. Uh, so for those of you who are native Californians, Cecilia, of course, had the Mandarin, the Mandarin restaurants 
in, in San Francisco and the Mandarin restaurant in Beverly Hills. And yeah. yep. and, and her son, Philip, right. is um, the Chang of P.F. Chang. P.F. Chang. <laughs> and Cecilia was inordinately proud of Philip. Yeah, yep. <laughs> he's really a lovely guy, too. So, so in many of the books, I think in all the books, you talk about your hard work in the kitchen and as a server in several food establishments. What's your view of the experience of commercial cooking when you got into it? Well, I mean, I, when I first got into it, I was in college, and my first view was I was shelving books for a dollar an hour, which was then the minimum wage when I was in college. And then my boyfriend became a w waiter at this fancy restaurant in Ann Arbor, and um, he said, you know, you should come be a waitress there. And on my first shift, I worked four hours and took home $35. And so my first one was, wow, this is, this is pretty incredible. Um, but learning about cook, I mean, everybody has this idea that cooking in restaurants is like cooking at home. And cooking in restaurants is like being in a factory. You know, it's an assembly line. It's, it's nothing like cooking at home. And that first restaurant was, um, it was a dream. Um, it, it was, this guy had had this fantasy about opening a restaurant in Ann Arbor and he did everything wrong. It, w it, was, a, it was great for me to learn it on someone else's dime. Um, he, um, he hired a chef from the Four Seasons in New York and the best grill guy from Detroit. He hired really experienced waiters and waitresses, which I was, fortu I was fortunate enough to be trained by them. He bought Limoges China, Baccarat Crystal, all of which broke in the first month. <laughs> and um, he had a chandelier that had come from a house that the Duke of Wales had, I mean, it, it was an insane, but it was a vision. You know, I'm going to open a really elegant French restaurant in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, for those of us who worked there, it was a wonderful experience, but he went out of business in two years um, and lost everything he had. And, you know, for me, it, it's the lesson I have learned over and over again in my career, which is, you really don't make money in fine dining. You know, I mean, ev all the big fine dining guys are guys who use their Daniel, their Spago, their you name it, as kind of loss leaders for the restaurants that actually do make money. You know, the restaurant at the airport, the, uh, you know, Danny Meyer opening um, the Shack. Union Square, right. and then Shake opening Shack. Shake Shack and becoming a billionaire opening Shake Shack. I mean, that's where the money is in restaurants. Your honesty blows me away. I mean, you go back and read these books. They're so good. <laughs> Is there anything you wish you had included in your early books and anything you wish you left out? Well, I, I think the biggest thing about my first book, I mean, my mother was no longer with us, but when I turned in the first draft of Tender at the Bone, my editor said to me, there's a secret in here that you're not telling us. And I don't know what it is, but there's something about this that doesn't ring true for me. And I said, well, I know what it is. It's my mother was seriously, seriously bipolar. And I didn't feel comfortable writing that about her. So I've tried to make her a kind of halcyon, anti-mame, character. And she said, well, it's not working. Um, so you either have to, you know, change your mother completely or tell the truth. And I thought about it for a long time. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm just going to say she was bipolar and I'm going to tell the true stories of these truly crazy things she did. Um, 
Bruce refers to her mother as the queen of molds. <laughs> because yeah. her mother would come up with these concoctions of food that had been in the refrigerator for quite a while. Yeah. I mean, and what what my mother I would I would as a child, my mother would go through the refrigerator scraping the the blue stuff off the top of everything and saying, a oh, little mold never hurt anyone. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I mean, she literally was famous for something she called everything stew, which was she would just take everything left over in the refrigerator, put it all together in one pot, stir it up, put it in the oven, and serve it to us. And it didn't matter what those things were. Um, and, um, you know, she did truly crazy things. Um, and I felt really guilty about outing her, and I certainly wouldn't have done it if she'd still been alive. But afterwards, I got so many letters from teenagers saying, it meant so much to me that you wrote, my mother is bipolar, and it's good to know that you can survive it. And I'm really grateful that you said that. And it was, for me, a lesson that you have to tell, you know, when you're doing memoir, you tell the truth. And if you don't feel comfortable about telling the truth about someone, you leave them out. But you, you just, you cannot hedge your bets. And, but I did have, in the back of my mind, this idea that I kind of owed it to my mother to write her book, because she had always wanted to write a book about what it was like to be bipolar, except that the very fact of being bipolar means that you will never finish anything that you do. <laughs> so um, it took me a while, but I eventually did write her book. You did? Yeah. You did. The, um, did you get blowback uh, for any of the profiles within your books in which you mention famous chefs? and foodies, uh, and those kind of things that are scattered through the books. Any names you're willing to share? <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't. I mean, but here's the thing for writers in the room. Y you never know where the blowback's gonna, be gonna come from, and there are things you worry about. So like, for instance, the Marion stuff. Before I published the book, I sent her the chapter on her and said, you know, I, I've said you're an alcoholic. I want you to read this. And she asked me to change something, but it had nothing to do with being an alcoholic. I mean, it, it, was, it was a tiny thing about her husband. Um, one of the chapters is about uh, my college roommate who um, discovers that she's adopted, and I sent her that chapter, and um, she asked me to change her name because, and I said, why? And she said, well, my children don't know that I was adopted, and they think that the father, the gra they think that their grandfather is their biological grandfather, and I'm gonna tell them, but I haven't done it yet, and this isn't how I want them to find it out. So I did change her name. But the most surprising blowback I ever got was from um, Save Me the Plums, where I, I wrote a chapter about David Foster Wallace. And I talked about the young editor who brought him in. And, you know, I said, you know, uh, Jocelyn had this idea, and I said, oh, he'll never write for us. And she said, well, I'm going to go after him. And he did write for us. Um, and after the book came out, I get this call from Jocelyn saying, you've destroyed my career. Um, and she happens to be one of my closest friends. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, well, you made me look like an idiot. There's a point in, in it where I can't handle what's going on, and you, you yourself have to talk to, to David. And um, I'm never talking to you again. And it's just she went on and on and on. And I said, you know. I don't, I don't think you're reading the book I wrote. Um, and then she called me back a couple of days later and apologized and said, all my friends are calling me up and congratulating me for having gotten <laughs> David Foster Wallace. Right, right. So, in, I think this book is, 
Wolfgang Puck, of course, is an institution. We've eaten his food. We've enjoyed his Aust Austrian accent. Uh, the woman he eventually married, Barbara Lazaroff, made him wear lederhosen to the wedding in Switzerland. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> true, true, true. And she's always seen as kind of a bizarre, berserk. Ruth does the most extraordinary explanation and explication of who she was in her general madness. I mean, bringing Crane in to take a fence down from a neighbor's house because she couldn't get the electrical fixed. I mean, just wild. And really gives her so much credit for Wolf's success at the beginning. She deserves it. And, and I have to say, I mean, we're still friends, but she was not happy about that portrait no. of her. Um, <laughs> people wow. rarely like what you write about them. But oh, Wolf, really? I never realized that. <laughs> <laughs> but Wolf is, is a genius. Yes. I mean, he, he really is a genius. And he actually asked me to write his biography, um, which I didn't, um, because he was also, David Gelb was doing a movie about him, and I thought... Um, it, don't get in the way. Don't yeah. get in the way of that. Um, but... Um, he he is he is truly in ex there there aren't there aren't very many people like Wolfgang in the world. I mean he's you know totally uneducated and a genius. I was having dinner with my friend Bob Trum at Spago. Ruth knows the story back in nineteen eighty six, mm. and uh, Bob asked me to marry him at the table, and I. 87. <laughs> 87. The romance started in 86. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. And I began to cry. And I'm a good crier when I get started. But Wolf thought that I was choking <laughs> and came over and said, Otzi, Otzi, stand up, and gave, began to give me the Heimlich. <laughs> and Bob said, no, no, we're getting married. At which point, he bought champagne for the entire restaurant. It's a great way. 86, 87, who cares? It was a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to get into food. What do you love to cook, and what do you refuse to cook? Um, I, I basically cook for other people. So what I love to cook is what whoever I'm cooking for wants to eat. So in the case of my husband, it means hamburgers most <laughs> of the time. I mean, Michael, Michael likes really simple food. Um, but, you know, it's no fun to me to cook something elaborate for someone who doesn't want to eat it. Um, what I really love to cook are, you know, something that will take me three days and is really complicated and I've never cooked before. Um, that's really fun for me. And I have no qualms about doing it for the first time for a party. I mean, if it's not good, it's a dinner. You know, big deal. I went to Ruth and Michael's house. I think when you first bought the house, and she had, I don't know, 50 people in the house. And I, you know, I thought, this is going to be great. It's going to be like pate and la di da and escargot. And there were Thai noodles. <laughs> and there were Thai noodles. <laughs> And there were Thai noodles. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, so I ate the first bowl, and then I ate the second <laughs> bowl, and then I ate the third bowl. And I understood that when she cooked it, it was a feast. And it really was yeah. a feast. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. What is your, yeah, be honest, what is your favorite cuisine? I love all the Asian cuisines. Um, I mean, I love most cuisines. I mean, I love French food, I love Italian food, but. You know, um, you know, I would eat Thai, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, you know, four times a day, very happily. So this is a clean copy, <laughs> which Ruth signed to my foodie son, uh, of a wonderful book. And my copy is kind of food stained. <laughs> I'm kind of a sloppy cooker, you know. I urge you to, if you're going to buy one book, buy this book. Because you can then leave the Barefoot Contessa and Julia Charles and Craig Claiborne and all these people. You, c you can, too, have a wonderful year cooking. Now, there are a few things in here I'm never going to cook. 
<laughs> but I read about them, and I kind of imagined how they tasted. What brought you to write this book? Well, uh, gourmet closing was really a horrible moment for me. I didn't me. bring it up. I didn't bring uh, it up. Well, no, it was, it was, you know, 70 people I really cared about lost their jobs. Um, and we had been very close. It had felt like a great run. I mean, I think for all of us, um, you know, this is what Save Me the Plums is about. It's, it, you know, the privilege of running a magazine where um, your boss basically says, just make me the best magazine you possibly can, spend what you have to spend, um, and lets you go, and where you have like really smart, passionate people working for you. And none of us saw it coming. I mean, I never in a million years thought that Condé Nast would close a 70-year mag 70 70-year-old magazine that had the best renewal rate of any magazine except The New Yorker in the world. Um, and I still don't believe that they closed it. I mean, it felt like it really didn't belong to us and it didn't belong to Condé Nast, that it really belonged to the readers. And I still feel like it was kind of a crime for them to do that. And it was a shock because at the time that it closed, we had the highest circulation and the highest renewal rate in the history of the magazine. Um, but, you know, it, it, we were in a bad patch at that moment because ad sales everywhere were down and ours were down more than most because of the magazine strategy. I mean, if you, if you have a luxury, if you decide that you're going to only take luxury ads and as my publisher um, then explained to me, he said, so if, if you're Tiffany's and your ad budget has been cut in half, are you going to cut Vogue or are you going to cut Gourmet? If you're, you know, Silver Seas Cruises, are you going to cut um, The Traveler or are you going to cut Gourmet? And he said, we're going we're gonna to tank for a year or so, but then it'll, they'll all come back because they love us. And I just didn't think that they would close. Anyway, I was incredibly depressed. But before we go to that, talk about how you saved the cookbook collection. I love this story. Oh. Um, so um, when they cl closed the magazine, and it was really fast. It was like, um, you know, Cy got up one morning and said, came, th came up to the office and said, you know, we're closing the magazine and your, your key cards will be good for 48 hours, I think. And then you're out of here. And I had to go on book tour for the second gourmet cookbook the next day, which was really weird because it wasn't my book, it, it, it belonged to them. But I felt like I should do it because my publisher had put so much into that. And so while everybody else is packing their stuff, I can't pack up my office. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, what's going to happen? We have this 70-year-old this library that is... Um, it, it has been used by the cooks for all this time, and it is the best, seven, the best cookbooks that have been published over the last 70 years, and it should remain intact. So the last thing I did before leaving for book tour was lock the, lock the library and take the key with me. Um, because I, didn't, I knew there would be looting. I knew that people from all the other magazines and Condé Nast would be coming down and taking things. And I thought, this, this collection should stay intact. And I called Cy and said, you really should donate the collection to NYU or the Schlesinger, and you should give them some money to maintain it. And he didn't want to do that. And Roseanne Gold, who, if you don't know Roseanne Gold's books, she's, she's a wonderful cookbook author. And the person who invented the three-ingredient recipe. Um, and she bought the library from Condé Nast and donated it to NYU intact. Uh, Good story. Good story.
Okay, we have two minutes left. What should I have asked you that I didn't ask? Oh my God. <laughs> I, I think you should, uh, I wanna tell the story of how Mary Louise and I met because when I was, when I was hired to go to the LA Times, I was put, in, they were just converting to computers. But they had three people, they had basically brought me in to push their then critic out. And I thought, this is very bad karma. You know, someday you're gonna be an old lady and some whippersnapper is gonna come in and be nipping at your heels. And I did, if I had known that's what they wanted me to do, I wouldn't have taken the job. But they, I didn't really have a job. They didn't know what to do with Mary Louise and they didn't know what to do with David K. Johnson, who has since won a Pulitzer for his reporting on tax taxes when he was at the New York Times. And the three of us were in a pod and they didn't give any of us computers. It was like, figure out what to do with yourselves, you three. Well, I had been hired as a society writer. Ha! Huh. And <laughs> Seymour Hirsch, who I'd worked with, in the McCarthy campaign called me up. He said, want to hear a joke? Some broad with your name has been hired as a society writer. <laughs> 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 but, but, the other three society writers were kind of phoning it in. <laughs> and in the same way that Ruth said, well, I'm gonna do this and this and this, I thought, well, I'll do this and this and this. And I wrote profiles. I did occasionally have to go like to the opening of a door or the opening of a can or something like that. <laughs> but, but, I will tell you, I got to do things like Bob Hope Drive, I spent three weeks with Bob Hope because they thought he was gonna drop dead, he was turning 80, little did they know. <laughs> <laughs> he was quite charming, quite charming. I was, I was really entranced by him, especially when he took me to the Toluca Lake golf course and I was on the little cart with him and I was driving along and there was our editor in chief, I got to wave. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth opened the world to many of us. I want to say this, not as, a, not as a, a peon, but as a reality check. She wrote restaurant reviews that when you read them, you think, well, gee, I could go to that restaurant. I could have that good meal. It would be worth my investment. And uh, it's kind of like when you buy a pass to come here to the Writers Guild, right? <laughs> it's, it's worth every cent, <laughs> as Jamie would say. So I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank especially our great friend, Ruth Reichel, and uh, have a good conference, okay?